So what do narcissists love to do? They love to accuse you of things falsely. Why do they love to accuse you of things falsely? Because they love to trigger you. They love to get under your skin. But let's take that a step even further. Okay, so what has been going on in your relationship? All right. So first of all, you have probably been supplying them. You've been giving them narcissistic supply. It started off where they love bombed you. They love bombed you. They came on super strong, were impossible to resist. They were charming. They were charismatic. They seemed perfect at the beginning. Am I right? Okay. Now you thought that they were amazing. You thought they were wonderful. Maybe you thought they even loved you. Maybe you thought that they were perfect. You know, all of these things. Now it was all a manipulation. I'm sorry to have to tell you this. It was all a manipulation. It was all meant to get this form of supply from you. Now I have to tell you, there are a couple of different kinds of supply. What you've probably been giving them is like the best form of supply. And the best forms of supply for them are, you know, adulation, service, making them look good, really, really stroking their ego at the top level. You know, there's di these different phases of a narcissistic relationship. There's the love bombing, and then you go into the devaluing, and then there's the discarding. And I have videos, by the way, on all the different phases of a narcissistic relationship, the love bombing, the devaluing, and the discarding. Definitely check out my videos on all of those phases of a narcissistic relationship if you haven't checked those out. When you go to leave a narcissistic relationship, whether it's you leaving or them leaving, that's when you go into that discard phase. That's when you see that smear campaign start. That's the birth of the smear campaign. By the way, it can start even before you even realize that the discard phase has started. All right. And I do have a whole video on how to shut down a narcissist smear campaign. You can check that out too. But what's happening is during this discard phase is that you've become public, public enemy number one, and you're no longer giving them the best form of supply anymore. So now they're going to want to continue to get supply from you, but they're just going to take it in the lower form of supply, which is making you miserable, making you squirm, showing them that they can still have control over you in some way. And so how are they going to do that? They're going to do these false allegations. And so they're going to start either through the court system, which is what I've seen as an attorney, by the way, over and over and over again. I mean, they file this stuff either through the pleadings. So you'll see it in the divorce pleadings. Well, they'll actually say these things in the divorce petition. They'll say father was a, you know, molester. I mean, I've seen that horrible, horrible things like that, or a, a wife beater or a child beater, or, you know, they will say, you know, the worst possible things you can imagine where you think, oh my gosh, I never even touched them. The worst possible things. Or they will just even say things like they didn't pay child support they withheld money, things like that. Or they spent lots of money. They spent lots of money on the people, lies about things like that. You will see those kinds of things in actual documents that are filed with the court. I think it's imp important that we walk through the types of false allegations that you will see. Then the other types of false allegations that you will see as well are people will see in, in the actual letters that go back and forth between the attorneys. They'll tell their attorney they didn't feed the children, that the children ate candy all weekend long or nothing all weekend long or pizza or junk food all the entire time that they were with the dad or the mom. 
or that the whole time they were with the dad or the mom, they were with a babysitter or nobody, all kinds of things. Now, are you dealing with a narcissist? And they've actually discarded you or you've discarded them and they're still completely obsessed with you. And you wanna know why in the heck that is? Before I can give you the exact why, I think it's really important that you understand the psyche of a narcissist. So a narcissist has no inner sense of value. They have to derive all of their value for, from the external. So they're constantly grasping on to whatever they can to get that source of, of supply, what we call narcissistic supply. And narcissistic supply is anything that feeds a narcissist's ego anything that feeds their ego. It could be bad, it could be good, it could be neutral, but as long as it's feeding their ego, then they're grasping onto it. It's seriously like a predator with its prey. Like they need to have that food. They're gonna grasp onto it wherever it is and they're going to hurt people, anybody who's going to um, threaten that source, okay? So just think of it like a really super hungry uh, uh, animal that's out in the wild and they finally see a food source and they're gonna grasp onto that and if somebody comes along and tries to threaten that source, they're gonna reach out and, and try to kill them or hurt them in some way because they have to have that, that food. And that's what's going on with the narcissist. They live on it, they feed on it. It's their food, it's their oxygen. And, and it can come in the form of many different versions. I mean, the whole fact that they have no boundaries and that they beef up their you know, egos and, and by saying how great they are and all of that, that's all a form of narcissism. But remember, we all, on some level, want to feel seen, heard, and know that we matter. So it's a continuum. I mean, all human beings have to feel some sort of value, and we all want to have other people notice our value as well. That's just part of being human. What differentiates a narcissist from everybody else wanting to know that they value, that they're valued, is that they have no sense of feeling or empathy or care or love for another human being. They just can't do it because they feel that if they do, it takes away from them. And that means you're taking away that food source, that oxygen source, their, their lifeblood, really. And they don't see, they don't understand it. They certainly have never processed it. It's totally subconscious, but that's what's going on. And so they attach themselves to people just the same as like pods do or leeches do, like because they need to attach themselves to people for food source. They never attach themselves to people in order to give to them in some way. It just doesn't even, they don't process the world that way. It's only what can this person or this situation do for me. And so when you're dealing with a narcissist, you're, you've been dealing with three different phases of the relationship, which are the love bomb, devalue, and discard. And if you want more information about those three phases of the relationship, definitely check out my videos on love bomb, devalue, and discard. During these three phases of the relationship, they can be love bombing you while they're devaluing you and love bombing while they're discarding. They really go back and forth between the phases. And yes, it starts with love bomb and it ends with discard, but it, everything's happening sort of all at once in that middle uh, stage. I had um, one of you guys actually commented on my videos. It's like, t it's love bomb in the beginning uh, discard at the end and toxic stew in between and that was a really great way of putting it. So, you know, while you're in the middle of the discard phase, you're still going to be getting love bombed and getting back, going back and forth um, between love bomb and discard, which is sometimes called hoovering because that supply source is being threatened and they don't want that supply source to go away. 
So even if they don't want you anymore and they're telling you, I don't want you anymore and, and they're rejecting you and they're telling you that you're a piece of crap and that you're a speck of dust on the planet and nothing matters about you, well, they obviously must think that there's still some amount of supply they can get out of you if they're still coming back to try to get more and trying to squeeze more out of you. So that's what's actually happening and why they're still obsessed with you. So if they feel like there's some way that they can still control you or if they, if, if you can, they can upset you or jerk you around in some way or get you all riled up about something, then that, they get supply from that so they're gonna come back and do that. Even if they like block you on something, well, they do that because they want to get a rise out of you. They want, to, they want you to go, oh my God, why did you block me? Or go back to other people and say, why did this person block me? And they, oh, they found out now that you're upset about that. So the best thing that you can do to get them to stop being so obsessed with you is to just completely go no contact with them and not give them any attention or any information whatsoever and just react to them like by, by just blocking them yourself and moving on and acting as if they just never existed in your life. Literally like you're wiping out that part of your CPU, like that person never existed in your life. That's the only way that they will finally and eventually stop being obsessed with you because they'll finally have to move on and find a different source of supply. They can't be rehabilitated. It's not like they're going to change. They're going to come back in the form of, you know, drunk text, texting you or um, saying that they're sorry or, you know, hoover you in some way by saying, you know, why aren't you responding to me and try to get you sucked back into their weird vortex of craziness. But you, you, you can't take that bait because if you do that, then that obsession with you will continue to just go on and on and on and on and on. If you are so ready to get that narcissist out of your life and say goodbye forever, give me a narc be gone in the comments. So to summarize, the reason why the narcissist is still so obsessed over you is because they still think that there's some shred of supply that they can get out of you. Whether it's upsetting you, jerking you around, devaluing you, degrading you, getting you to pay attention to them in some way, controlling you in some way, whatever that is, that's why they're still obsessed with you. There's some version of supply that they still think that they can get from you. And until there's no more supply to be gotten from you, they're going to continue to be obsessed with you. Even if it seems like they've moved on to their new supply, if they can still get supply from the new one and the old one, even better for them. Because remember, they need an endless amount. It's like this black hole that can never be fed, right? They can never be sati satiated. So as long as they still think there's some kind of supply they can get out of you, they're going to continue to be obsessed over you. Why do I do this? I do this because I have had to deal with narcissists in my law practice, but I've also had to deal with them in my real life. And I know what it's like. I've had to deal with them creating chaos in my own life. Yeah, I had to deal with not just one, but two covert narcissists actually targeting me, not as husbands, but close enough to actually cause real drama, trauma, and chaos, as I like to say, drama, trauma, and chaos. And I have helped people create real freedom, possibility, and purpose in their real lives. So I'm on this mission. I'm on this crusade to help people actually save your lives and I understand why they need to create chaos. They do it in all aspects of your lives, especially in negotiations, because with narcissists, you're either for them or against them. And when you are against them, they've decided you are public enemy number one. They want to take you down. Why? Because they want to take you down before you take them down. It's a black and white world with them. They want to feel powerful. And how can they feel powerful? Well, if they create chaos, then 
They can intimidate you. They enjoy that power. They enjoy stirring things up. They like to see you squirm. They like to see you be intimidated. So they like to make that world chaotic because then they feel like they're controlling it. They're stirring the pot. If they've made the world chaotic, then they've done that. Oh, look what I've done. I'm looking at the people scurrying around that I've made scurry. They think they've done that. It's like they've made the minions all scurry around, even if it's only for a minute, right? And they want to destroy anybody who is threatening their sense of power or their sense of of self-worth. So they enjoy creating this chaos because it also distracts them from their own sense of insecurity, their own sense of problems with their own sense of self-worth. And so it's a coping mechanism. It helps them avoid their own sense of insecurities and shame. They carry a deep sense of shame. It's the same reason, by the way, that they always create chaos around holidays and birthdays. They don't want people to not be paying attention to them. They want all the focus and attention on themselves. And if you want to know more all about why narcissists like to ruin holidays, definitely check out my video on why narcissists ruin holidays. Holidays are coming up soon, so might as well find out why. Go check it out. Check out my video on why narcissists ruin holidays coming up. And by the way, if you guys have seen this, definitely give me a totally in the comments or give me your example of what you have seen on how the narcissist has created chaos in your lives. Okay. So the other way that narcissists love to create chaos is through verbal abuse, through physical violence, And why do narcissists do anything that they do? Well, they get supply from it. Everything they do is to get this narcissistic supply, which is anything that feeds their ego. And remember what I said, that there's a hierarchy of supply and there's that diamond level supply, which is that supply, which is the outer things the big house, the money, the prestigious job, the prestigious cars, the prestigious friends, the things that they would be happy to tell people about. But then there's what I call the dark underbelly of narcissistic supply, which is the, I'm going to control you, debase you, diminish you, manipulate you. And that is where that chaos comes from. And because they don't have any care or concern or empathy for other people's feelings, manipulating people and as if they're game pieces on a board, creating chaos in their lives, telling a piece of gossip or saying something about somebody that's not true, creating that chaos, filing a motion in court that is totally false, whatever. It doesn't bother them because they're narcissists. That creates chaos. They don't have any feeling about that. They get supply from it, feeds their ego. They have now stirred the pot. It feeds their ego. They get a high from that. And by the way, they can, they can get chaos also. They can create a, a sense of chaos by false promises promising somebody something and that person, oh, I'm excited. I'm, this is going to happen. And then not keeping that promise, letting that person down. They can't keep the promise that creates chaos in somebody's life. And they, they get a high from that. It's really sick or sabotaging somebody's relationship and telling somebody something about them or showing up in a situation, getting attention showing up at an event that they shouldn't be at to get attention creates chaos. They get something out of that. Showing up when somebody is sick at the hospital and getting attention from that, that also can create chaos. 
They love that. It all is for the one thing, narcissistic supply to get their ego fed. That's it because that's what they're after. It's always what they're after. It's all to feed their ego. That's why they need to create their chaos. They get a high from it. And because they don't have any sense of care, concern, or empathy for others, it's not tied to their people's feelings. Unfortunately, that's how it goes. They, they don't have any sense of guilt. If you're standing over there wondering, how can they do that to somebody? Don't they wonder about the consequences? Don't they feel anything for anybody? Don't they wonder about ruining somebody's lives? Or no, the answer is no. And so stop doing that exercise. It's not going to get you anywhere. Forget about it. Stop wondering why or how they could. Or, that for you is a big waste of time. Just accept they are who they are. You are not going to get closure. You are not going to get them to see the error of their ways. All of those things are a waste of time for you. You are better off stopping focusing on that. It, the more you give it energy, the more it will multiply. What you focus on, you get more of. So focus on something that will actually bring you more of what you want, let go of that. Namaste and walk away, send them light, move on. That is the best advice that I can give you. So let's talk about why does a narcissist need to destroy you to leave you? Uh, or even if you're leaving them, anything that's regarding the discard phase of a narcissist means that they're going to try to bring you down, destroy you, out to get you, no matter what. And you think, why? Why does this have to be, you know, destroying? Why, why can't we just come to a nice, reasonable conclusion? Well, the answer is, as it always is when it comes to narcissists, it goes back to that whole concept of narcissistic supply. Um, and, you know, supply is anything that feeds their ego they have no sense of inner self that is very, very fragile. They're the most insecure people on the planet. And so they have to get all their value from the outside and they protect it no matter what. It's really a survival instinct. It's like, you know, if, if, if you live, then I can't, if you survive, then, then that means I don't. It, it really to them is like a war and you're the enemy. Um, I've had to deal with a couple of narcissists myself in my own life. And one of them was a covert narcissist, or actually they were both covert narcissists. But in one of them, I, you know, had a situation where I was like, you know, I'm hoping to really, uh, you know, have a peaceful resolution to the end of this relationship. You know, it was a situation where it wasn't working for me in a, in a kind of a business setting. And, um, I wanted to have a peaceful resolution and this other person just couldn't do that. They couldn't do that. And why can't they do that? Because they just feel like if you uh, are, are happy in your new life or anything like that, then, you know, that's the end of the world for them. So what happens is in the discard phase of a, of a relationship, and if you want to know more of a, about the discard phase of a narcissistic relationship, check out my video on narcissistic discarding and what happens there at the end of the relationship. But in that phase, that's when you start to see the birth of the smear campaign. And that's when they start lining up their flying monkeys, start triangulating. And the, the, the discard phase and that smear campaign can happen even long before you think that it's actually the end of the relationship. They're just making sure that if anything ever happens, that, you know, they're going to be the ones that have the upper hand. So, you know, when it comes time for that to happen, that's when you'll start to see them talking to other people. They might start slipping in little things about, 
you know, uh, you know, this person is difficult or, um, you know, that they're a victim of you in some way. They haven't been treated well, well by you in some way. I was actually just having a conversation with uh, somebody yesterday who I'm going to be interviewing uh, coming up for my podcast and, and for this show. And, you know, he was talking about how crazy it is that, you know, it's normally the empath. And you're, you know, you're normally the one who's doing everything for the relationship. You're carrying the relationship. You're basically, you know, uh, 90% of the work and, and all of that, no matter whether it's a personal relationship or a business relationship, it's never equitable. You're always the one doing most of everything and hoping that the other person will eventually appreciate you, will eventually realize how much you're doing and, and how much you're putting into it. And you're, you're constantly walking on eggshells and you're constantly being gaslit and, you know, passive aggressive techniques, you know, being thrown at you and, and your brain is like, you know, scrambled eggs or something. And yet then they turn around and start going to third parties and saying how awful you are and how, you know, much you've, you know, taken advantage of them and basically all the things that they're doing to you, they go and tell everybody that uh, you're doing to them. And a lot of times, especially if they're a covert narcissist, they're really good at playing the victim and everybody thinks they're so kind and generous and nice because that's how they are to every single person in the world other than the person, the people that are closest to them. And so it's really, really um, surprising for, for, for those of us who are empaths that, that this is what's going on. And you almost, you're always kind of like a step behind because you don't realize that this is going on. So what happens in a litigation setting is, you know, you empath are over here going, well, let me try to figure out a way to nicely come to a resolution of this case or, or, or of this relationship in some way. Let me figure out what we can do. And, and this is what happens with a lot of us. I hear a lot of you saying to me, I, I just want this, or I'll just take this small amount. I don't want everything. I'm not going for this part. You know, I don't care about the money. I just want my kids, or I don't care about um, you know, all of this other, these other, other assets, all I want is this or whatever. And, you know, by doing that, what you're, you're, you're just making smaller, what, what it is that, um, you're going to tell them that you want and whatever that is, they're going to chip away at that. Even if it's the smallest little thing, because it's not about that settlement for them. What it's about for them is making you miserable, continuing to control you, continuing to uh, manipulate you, continuing to intimidate you. All of those things give them narcissistic supply. And that's why when you're dealing with them in a negotiation setting, in a case, whether it's in a business litigation or a divorce litigation or probate litigation or whatever kind of case you're dealing with, you know, sometimes it goes on for years. You know, I have a private Facebook group. It's called Narcissist Negotiators with Rebecca Zung, which you are very welcome to join. And we'll make sure that we drop a link to that as well. I did a survey in that group and it was overwhelming the response that, you know, I think over 86% of you responded that your cases lasted at least 18 months. Many of you, I think it was 40 something percent said that the cases lasted more than three years. And a, a huge percentage of you said that the cases were very, very expensive. You know, some, uh, many times over a hundred thousand dollars in fees. So, you know, for those of you out there who are saying, all I need is a good lawyer, that is not the case because yes, you do need a good lawyer, but you also need to understand the mind of a narcissist. And that is that they're out to destroy you because they want to get you before you get them. They want to make sure that they're right on top of the fact that you're the one that looks bad and they're the one that looks good because they need to preserve their face. They need to preserve their um, they're standing in the community or how they look, their reputation, all of that. And so 
in order for them, in their minds, to preserve all of that, it can't be equal walking away. You can't just both look good walking away. You have to look bad. You have to look like the loser to them. That's the only way they feel that they can survive, that they can preserve that narcissistic supply that they so desperately need. And if you are so ready to be free of this crazy toxic stew that narcissists are doing to you and especially trying to destroy you, I want to see if this ends now in the comments. Okay, and so the last reason why narcissists feel like they have to destroy you is because, again, it goes back to this narcissistic supply idea, and that is that they they feel like if you're not going to be supplied to them, then they don't want you to be supplied to anyone. And so, you know, it's, 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 you got to go down. You've got to go down in every single way for every single reason. And so that's why when you are negotiating with a narcissist, it's really important to have incredible strategy super strong leverage, you know, anticipate what the narcissist is going to do and focus on you and your case. All right. So what happens when that narcissist realizes that life just absolutely sucks without you? Ugh, it's the best, first of all. So here's the thing. Here's the, like the total paradox that I've had to deal with narcissists in my real life real life, not just in my law practice. Yes, I've had to deal with them in my law practice. I've had a lot of them. As clients, as opposing counsel, as judges, as opposing clients, even as employees sometimes. Not too many of those, thank goodness. But, you know, I've had to deal with them. But the worst ones that I've had to deal with have been a couple of covert narcissists that have actually targeted me mm -hmm. and not fun. Let me tell you, not fun. The worst. Here's the, what I call the narcissist paradox. The narcissist paradox is that they treat you like crap the entire time. And then they don't want you to leave. They're actually shocked when you leave. They're desperate for you to stay, but you want to run the hell out of there. Like your hair is on fire. Like you are running the hell away. Like your body is on fire. Like you want to get the hell out of there, but they are like, oh my God, you're leaving. What? Like they don't want you to go, but yet the whole time you were there, they actually kind of gave you the impression like life sucked with you. They're so screwed up, these people. They are really so screwed up in a lot of ways. But yes, they literally hate you and it's a mess. In a lot of ways, they, they do hate you in some ways. And I actually have a whole video on that. Eight reasons the narcissist hates you. You definitely want to check that out. But you, you can't wait to get, to get the hell out of there. I know. But then they have a major meltdown because you actually left. And why do they have a major meltdown that you left? Not because they miss you. They're going to say it's because they miss you. They miss the oxygen source that you are, the food source that you are. They miss the supply that you are, okay? They miss what you bring to them, whatever it was that you were bringing to them. It's not good, all right? It's not what you want. You don't want to be missed in that way. They were, they were using you. I can't say it in any nicer way way. I mean, the truth of the matter is they were using you for whatever it is they were using you for. And I mean, as a supply source. So yeah, they're desperate. They're desperate to get you back. They're desperate to get whatever supply source back that you were to them because they were using you. So they were using you for money, sex, maybe it was company, Maybe it was you loving them in some way, but it, it was not because of you. They do have a desperate, massive fear of, a, of abandonment, and they will go through stages, rage, anger, 
they definitely took you for granted. And they really did think you would stick around. And, and they really do see things in black and white. And they really will want to go after you. So they will do things to retaliate. They will line up flying monkeys and they're going to go through this rage and anger. And they will try to line up other forms of supply in a desperate measure to sort of replace the supply that you were, okay? Because they need that supply. So they're going to want to try to replace whatever the form of supply was that you were. So whatever it was, whether it's, you know, in the form of a flying monkey, somebody else, whether it's trying to get your attention. So if, if you're in a lawsuit situation, they may try to do that. They may file all kinds of motions against you, use the court system against you try to replace one form of supply with another by, okay, if you're not going to give me supply in the form of money or sex or attention in one way, I'm going to replace it in another way by manipulating you and controlling you and making your life miserable, using the court system against you, using the kids against you, whatever I need to. Maybe I'll try to make you feel guilty. Maybe I will love bomb you, flood you. If they realize you're not coming back, then they, they will start to struggle. They will start to be, you know, come undone. They may really have a, a, a crisis of self because they don't have a sense of self. They may start to stalk you. I mean, depending on how malignant they are. And they may start to stalk you. They may, there may be violence. There may be threats of violence, but they're not going to have remorse if they're a real narcissist. They're not going to have remorse for you. You know, they may be watching you. I mean, they're super creepy. And if you think that is so creepy, put so creepy in the comments. And they may begrudgingly move on to another form of supply if they have to, which is what you want. You want them to lime on down the road. You need them to do that because if they're not true narcissists, they're not going to be rehabilitated. At least that what you have to come to terms with. You have to come to terms with you're not getting closure. They're not going to come back to you and say, I'm sorry. And you're not going to get that. I didn't appreciate you enough. I took you for granted. I'm sorry. You know, you're not going to get that. Oh, let's stay friends. None of that's going to happen. So just forget about all of that. You know, the closure you're going to get is you found out that this person was not a good person. Good for you. Move on and find somebody who can appreciate you and heal yourself. Become whole and complete so that you don't repeat the pattern for the next time and let that person be who they are. Otherwise, you know, you just have to know that they're going to figure out, you know, that they're, they're going to have to get a different form of supply and, you know, they'll probably keep watching you. They'll keep comparing. They'll figure out, oh, is that person, do they have a better form of supply? How are they doing? Am I doing better than they are or, or not? You know, because they don't have a sense of self you can heal yourself. And the best thing that you can do is move on and forget about them. Hopefully you'll no longer care. They, they don't have that sense of self. So they'll keep watching and they'll keep comparing and they'll keep stewing. Let them do that. You forget about them, right? Don't look back, you know, like that old Boston song. Don't look back. Yeah. That's what you want to do. And that's my best advice to you. Seriously, I have done it myself and it is seriously the best. So what's going on when that narcissist says, I love you. So let's talk about first what's going on with a narcissist, period. Narcissists have no inner sense of value. They have no sense of self. Something was broken deep inside of them a long time ago, which caused them, you know, in their childhood at some point, which caused them to be broken and to see the world as a place that they have to manipulate, as a place that 
you know, where they have to try to grab as much as they possibly can from people uh, in order to feed their endless and, and black hole need for supply. And so, of course, everything they do is in that quest, is part of that quest, including manipulating and devaluing and debasing people and, and controlling people and in, intimidation and flying monkeys and triangulation, all of that stuff is all to get to one place and that is to suck as much supply out of the environment and from the people around them as they possibly can. So when they go to say, I love you, um, it's part of that manipulation. And, you know, before I go into the what does it mean and what does it not mean thing, one of the things I really want you to understand and really want you to get is that you can't take any of this personally. And I know I've talked before about the book, The Four Agreements, and, you know, it's four agreements that you make with yourself. And one of the agreements is not to take anything personally. And the reason why you can't take anything personally is because the way people treat other people, good or bad, is a direct reflection of the way they feel about themselves. And so, you know, don't have regrets. Don't sit there and, and, and say there must be something wrong with you because all of that is just a waste of time, breath, and energy. You know, all you can do is take yourself from this place where you are right now and look forward and make changes now. And, you know, if you're watching this video, that means that you're ready to maybe start making some changes and starting to the process of getting educated and learning what's really going on with these very broken people is part of that healing process. It's once you start to realize what it is that you're dealing with, that's when you can start to realize it's nothing that you could have done. There's no way that you could have helped these people. And more importantly, it had nothing to do with you. You were just part of that narcissist scheme and plan in order to try to get supply for themselves. It was never about you. So what does a narcissist mean when they say, I love you? So the first thing that they mean when they say they love you is that they enjoy what they get from you when they're around you. They love how you make them feel. And the second thing is actually somewhat related to that. And that is that they love the way you love them. So a lot of times that's what they really mean, which is I love the way you love me. I love the way you give me narcissistic supply. That's really awesome to me because I need as much narcissistic supply as I can possibly get. And I love that you give it to me. The next one is that they love the social status they get from being around you. You know, maybe you've elevated them. Maybe you have more prestige in their eyes than they did. Maybe you have uh, traits or, or circles or people around you that um, allows them to feel like they're elevating themselves when they're with you and they love that. So um, that's the next thing that they could potentially mean when they say, I love you. The next one is that maybe they just mean, I love having sex with you. I'm really, really attracted to you. And being attracted to a person does not necessarily mean that you love the person. So remember that. I mean, you know, an attraction is really just an animalistic kind of, you know, we, we all are um, attracted to whoever, whomever we are attracted to and innately and um you know so they can be attracted to you and they can be very very attracted to you but that doesn't necessarily mean that they love you so that's the fourth one they they, they might really love having sex with you and by the way if you think that you are a victim of narcissistic abuse in a sexual way um, check out my videos on narcissism and sex I have three different ones and, um, you know, I, I want you to understand that being a victim 
of a narcissist in a sexual manner is just part of their overall abuse. And, and so make sure that you check out those videos as well. The next thing that they might mean is that they just want you to love them. So they'll say it to you so that you will love them. Or maybe it's that, you know, they want you to be under their web of control and so, and, and, and they want you to become attached to them. Uh, so they'll say it like, so that you say it back so that you will become attached to them, that you will love them. I, I have often joked that nobody falls in love faster than a narcissist who needs a place to live. So maybe it's simply that they need a place to live and they want to move in with you. Maybe they really like your place better. Maybe they don't have a lot of money and um, they just want you to support them and take care of them. And they're ready to quickly move that relationship along to the next level. So sometimes they say, I love you too, because they want to move in with you and they just want to get that relationship going to the next level. So they'll say, I love you for that reason as well. The next one is that they just, they might say it because they don't want you to abandon them, or maybe they just don't want you to be mad at them, or maybe they, they're trying to deflect something that, um, they, they did wrong or that you want them to take responsible, responsibility for. So they'll go ahead and say, I love you for that reason. And the last one is that maybe they will tell you they love you because they think that you look good together as a couple. It's sort of related to the social status one. They think you look good together as a couple and, or maybe they think that um, you're super attractive and that you kind of elevate um, how they look, you know? So, um, so that's the, another thing that they could potentially mean when they say, I love you. And if you have seen any of these things, give me an I've seen it in the comments. Okay, so now let's go into what they don't mean when they say, I love you. So one of the things that they definitely don't mean is, that they love you unconditionally because believe me, it is very much conditional. As soon as they don't feel like you're giving them enough narcissistic supply or another better source of supply comes along, off they will go. So, and, and, or if you're sick or if you need something from them or you're too demanding or anything else, um, or if you're calling them out on their behavior, no matter what it is that they don't like, you know, there, there goes that love that they, they undyingly pledge to you. So especially eternal love. Um, narcissists don't not generally, um, you know, they're not great with relationships and they're not great with, um, you know, intimacy and being close to people. Uh, so, you know, that, that love, whatever it is, it definitely, when they say, I love you, it does not mean unconditional love. The next thing it doesn't mean is that, you know, that they love you for who you are. They love you for what you can do for them. They love you for what supply you give to them. They do not love you for who you are as a person, the essence of you, um, the, the caring about you, the feelings uh, for uh, and compassion for whatever it is that is going on with you and your life they don't have any feeling about that. Um, in fact, they may resent it. So um, unfortunately, when they say they love you, it doesn't mean that um, they care about you and love you for who you are. It also does not mean that they will be treating you with consideration and kindness. And it definitely does not mean that they will be putting your needs <laughs> ahead of theirs. I mean, that's just the last thing that they would possibly ever want. So, you know, if God forbid you happen to uh, really, really need them for some reason, um, you know, maybe your best friend died or you're sick. Maybe you have COVID in this crazy time of, of, uh, on our planet or, or something like that where you're really in need. Um, that's when they start to get resentful. They start to actually get angry at you. Uh, and if you try to call them out on their behavior, there goes the, um, the deflection and denying and, and the 40s. And, and if you want to know more about 
the four D's, check out my video on what happens when you catch a narcissist in a lie. I go all into those four D's in that particular video. Okay. So narcissists, they like to prod you. They like to poke you. They like to, oh, they just want to get under your skin all the time. They do it on purpose. Why do they do it? You know, they do it on purpose. Why do they do that? Well, there is a short and simple answer to that. They want the narcissistic supply from it. Okay. I mean, it's why they do everything that they do. So let's reel back. What is narcissistic supply for those of you who just starting with that, with this whole thing, you maybe you haven't watched any of my other videos in the past. Let's talk about what that means. So narcissists, they have no sense of self. Okay. They have no inner sense of value. I haven't actually said this in a while in my videos. So they're, they're like that hollow chocolate Easter bunny. They look kind of nice on the outside, but there's nothing going on on the inside. And so to have any feeling of value whatsoever, they have to kind of layer it on and how they layer it on is something called narcissistic supply. And so the way I look at it is there's like different kinds of supply. And so supply can be Oh, you know, the, the nice things in life, you know, which there's nothing wrong with, by the way, you know, like money and prestige and big houses and great, you know, jobs being with the right people and status and all those things, which there's nothing wrong with in and of themselves. But, you know, then there's this dark underbelly of what I call narcissistic supply, which there's definitely something wrong with, which is trying to make yourself feel better by pushing people down, like controlling people, devaluing people, debasing people, you know, bolstering yourself by pushing other people down. So those are kind of the various ways that they get narcissistic supply. And they delight in getting supply by triggering people. It's a way of controlling you. They enjoy seeing people squirm and seeing people be intimidated and all that sort of thing. So that's, that's kind of one reason why they enjoy triggering you and seeing you that way. And in a negotiation setting, there are a number of reasons why triggering you can be beneficial to them. I mean, it's not just seeing you squirm. It's not just seeing you fly off. I mean, there, there, there actually can be a few other reasons for it as well. And it was actually well demonstrated in the Netflix mini series called I Care A Lot which actually I did a whole video on it where I broke it down, which you can definitely check out my breakdown of that mini series. And the main character was a woman who was supposed to be, you know, taking care of these elderly people, like as a guardian, she was talking to this older woman. There was nothing wrong with her, but of course this woman the woman who was like the guardian would get paid if there was something wrong with these people. So she goes to this nursing home and she's talking to this woman and she purposely triggers this woman. Like she whispers things in her ear to like get her angry. She purposely triggers her. She purposely says things to her. So it's not just to get supply from her, not just to see her squirm, not just to get delight, not just to laugh at how funny it is to like that she's like, so, you know, out of control, but there's another even more sinister reason that she did that because there were cameras watching. So this, she's like whispering things in this older woman's ear. And so what happens, the older woman stands up. I don't think she stood up. I think she just reached over and started choking the guardian, the woman. And there's the camera watching. So then she was able to catch her and trap her. So another more sinister reason that narcissists intentionally trigger you is because they're able to make you look like the crazy one then. 
and they're actually able to then make you look like the bad one and use that against you, especially if you have some sort of litigation going on, you have some sort of potential court action. Now they're able to use that. And that's what this woman did in this, in this show. And so you have to be aware of that when narcissists are, you know, intentionally trying to trigger you it's so hard, it's so hard sometimes because they're, you know, they really do know what your trigger points are, especially if they've known you for a long time, you know, if it's been a romantic relationship or it's a family relationship, or if it's business partnership, you know, something where the person has known you for a long time and they've had the opportunity to get to know what your weak points are. They know how to trigger you. And so they'll know what to do, what, what to say, you know, even in this situation, like in that show, like she didn't even know, know her that well, but she knew what to say to get that woman to like try to choke her. And you no, know, then she takes it right into the judge. She shows the judge and the judge was like, oh, clearly this woman's a danger. She needs to stay in this place. Clearly there's something wrong with her. Yep. Mm -hmm. Another reason they try to trigger you is so that they can catch you and trap you, make you look like the crazy one, make you look like the emotional one, make you look like the one that the judge should be looking out for. And please, please, please always remember that every text, every email, every writing, everything you put your hand to is a potential trial exhibit. So don't get triggered, don't take the bait. They want you to take that bait. They're dying for you to take the bait. So be careful of that. So, you know, number one is to get supply from it. Number two is to goad you into doing something. Number three is they just, they literally get a high from it. They, they get off on it. They do. Yeah, I know. It's super sick. And if you agree, it's super sick. Give me a totally in the comments right now. Yeah, totally. So sick. I know. Number four, the reason why they intentionally trigger you is they want to know. Sometimes they just want to make sure that they still have control over you. They want to just check if they still have that power over you. Do I still have you in my little web? Do I, do I still have control over you? Oh, yes, I do. That's number four. Just a little check-in. Let me see if I, if I still do. Uh, so sometimes they, they intentionally trigger you for that reason as well. So don't take the bait. Do not take that bait. Okay. So let's talk about the only kind of relationship that will actually work for narcissists. So first of all, in order to understand that you have to understand narcissists in general. So narcissists have no sense of inner value. They're really an empty shell inside. They, they have no sense of self. Something happened to them when they were children that, that made them feel like the world is a scary place. The world is a place that is not to be trusted. It's a place that, that they have to survive. They're almost like gasping for air. I kind of almost think of it as like, they are maybe starving or they're in a swimming pool and they have to like, they can't breathe or something. And so in order for them to survive, they have to grasp onto things and, and nobody else can, can have it, you know? And, and if, they, if they give it all, then they won't survive. And so it's kind of a, a sad way to be but you empaths out there, I see you out there, you know, you can't save them. You can't love them back to health without you being sucked in and drowning yourself because it's really a black hole. You try to give, 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 give. You end up drowning along with them because it never comes back to you. So what happens is narcissists need to be that center of attention and everything revolves around them all the time. And you, you just find yourself constantly giving, 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 and they're just taking, taking, taking. And all of a sudden, after many, many years, you realize 
that you just feel drained and you just feel like the life has been drained out of you. They're highly, highly sensitive. They are very easily slighted. I often say that narcissists hear tones like dogs hear whistles. You have to be really, really careful about how you say things because Sometimes you're just saying things and they, they're like, oh, I don't like how, how you said that. And you're like, oh, I didn't even say anything like anything. And they feel like you, you said something with a tone or they think you said it sarcastically or something and you didn't say anything like that. They definitely don't like to be told what to do, but yet they want everybody else to follow orders. They will ghost you sometimes, but yet when you aren't immediately available, then they will start blowing up your phone or show up at your house or your office. And where were you? And how come you didn't respond right away? So it's, it's a very one-sided type of relationship in that sense. You have to be immediately available, but they don't. They have to have full access to everything that you're doing. You don't necessarily have that with them, they definitely don't want you to ever catch on to who they actually are because that could be really, really damaging. I have a whole video, by the way, on when the narcissist knows that you know, which you could definitely check out. They definitely don't want a relationship where their partner is more successful than them or is more the center of attention than they are because they will devalue the other partner. They'll, they'll put the other partner down. You know, if, the, if their partner is more popular than them, they certainly won't like that. That's never going to work out for them. They'll be jealous of that. So th there's that. The narcissist partner should always make sure that the narcissist feels special, give them lots of adulation, lots of compliments, make sure that they feel really cared for, even if it means going to extraordinary lengths. You know, the narcissist has to feel like they're in charge. The narcissist has to feel like they're always right. And if you know that I am right so far, give me a big yup in the comments. So, you know, it's really not so great to be in a relationship with a narcissist. And, you know, a lot of times the narcissist is prone to what I call the three deadly sins of a relationship, which I call the three A's, abuse, addiction, and adultery. Also not great. It erodes the fundamental integrity of a relationship. The trust factor, also not the greatest. Oftentimes you don't even really get to express your feelings. Your feelings don't matter in a narcissistic relationship. You don't feel like you can be yourself when you are in a relationship with a narcissist, you feel like your soul is being crushed when you are in a relationship with a narcissist. But, you know, that's the only kind of relationship that works for a narcissist sometimes because they are the only one that matters sexually as well. I mean, I've done entire videos on that also. Basically, ab above everything, their needs have to be number one. And it's all about them and it's all about them and their needs. And so think about this also, when you go to negotiate with them, a lot of times a, a, a strategy is that potentially the, the negotiation strategy could be that it has to be their idea. You know, the settlement plan might be kind of getting them to come up with the idea of what the settlement plan might be, which is totally fine sometimes, you know, let, let them think it was their idea. Let them come to that conclusion because who cares if, if it ultimately ends up being what it is that you want anyway. A lot of times you have to take your ego out of it. And I always say, you know, do your best acting job and go, oh my gosh, I can't believe that's what we ended up with. 
because at the end of the day, if it was what you wanted anyway, let them think that they won because then at least you're done. If they think that you won, then you probably won't get to a resolution. Now let's talk about word salad. What the heck is a word salad? Narcissists use a variety of things to deflect anything off of themselves and make sure that the other person thinks that they're crazy. They use gaslighting and all sorts of other techniques in order to maintain control over their victims or their their targets. So when you are in a relationship with a narcissist, you're going to be dealing with word salad. And I've actually heard some of my clients and my, um, my subscribers and the people in my community have talked about how their brains end up feeling like scrambled eggs. It really is in a, a form of emotional abuse. It's a form of how they traumatize their victims. And it, it, it can leave you feeling very confused and very... Um, you powerless and paralyzed. So, you know, let, before I talk about word salad, uh, let me just give you a little bit of a basic. If you haven't watched any of my other videos before, I want to make sure that I give you some basics, which is that a narcissist has no inner sense of value. They have to get all of their value from the external. Something happened with them when they were a child. They feel, um, you know, they have no, no self-esteem. They're actually extremely insecure, extremely fragile. And while all of us are on a continuum in some ways, I mean, in some ways, all of us have, you know, what people would refer to as narcissistic traits, meaning, hey, we all want to feel seen, heard, and know that we matter. That is a universal feeling. If you are a human being, you have those feelings and there is nothing wrong with those feelings. Of course we matter. And of course we need to feel whole and complete. The thing is where you're dealing with a narcissist is where it becomes pathological, where it becomes, they, they absolutely need to have it. They thrive on that. And it's so far gone on the continuum that they just have completely lacked any ability to care about another person. A lot of times people think, oh, that person says that they're so great, they have to be a narcissist. Well, you're forgetting about the second half of that, which is not only do they think that they're great, which is nothing wrong with that, right? But they completely lack any ability to have any feelings or, or care or empathy for another person. They may know what to do to pretend and when they're, when they're love bombing, they're in that. And they, they do long for connection, but it, they just are so pathologically ill in a lot of ways. I mean, they're mentally ill. They cannot cross that bridge. So they feel that they have to manipulate the world in order to get what they want. And so they use a variety of tools in, they have a, like a whole little tool chest that they go to, to manipulate the world and to gaslight people and to um, just to, to continue to maintain control. In other words, they just don't feel inside that anybody will actually ever love them or be with them unless they are manipulating the situation. It's, it's actually quite sad, but you empath, yeah, I'm talking to you, you cannot fix them and the emotional abuse will not stop. They, they really can't be rehabilitated other than to, and I've talked to psychologists about this and I do highly recommend that you watch some of my other videos like with Dr. Romani and um, specifically my interviews with Dr. Romani and Tina Swithin in One Mom's Battle, uh, how, to rep yourself, how to Represent Yourself in Court. Dr. Romani actually talks about if they can be rehabilitated. And basically, she talks about how they can learn how to behave sometimes. Like they're, they're, she has actually had a few narcissists as patients, and she's been able to get them to a point of being able to kind of 
pretend like they care enough about people or, or go through the motions or act the right way, but they don't actually ever come to a point of truly caring because they just, there's something within themselves that's like broken. It's, it's like wishing somebody could grow an arm back if, if their arm has been, um, you know, amputated or something for some reason. So it's just the, those, some, some things are just not possible. So it, as part of their world of manipulation, they use something called word salad. And in the narcissism world, that basically means that they, they, they talk in a way that's like circular conversation. That's one of the things, you know, you think something is, is settled and then they come back as if it hasn't been settled and, and there they bring it up again. And you're thinking, wait a minute, I thought we had done that conversation. Why are you bringing that up again? Um, you know, something like that. So, you know, you'll, you, you'll, you'll provide an explanation for something, for example, you know, why did you, why were you late? And you say, I was late because uh, I was taking care of my sister. And then you have some big fight about it or whatever, but you, you, prove it, you show, I was late because I was taking my sister, blah, blah, blah. And then like five minutes later, they come back. Why were you late? I can't believe that you were late. I can't believe you did this to me. And you think, didn't we just have this conversation? I thought we had this conversation, but there you are having it again. And they're just trying to like force it out of you again. And it's just a way of trying to make you feel bad or feel guilty or give them attention and show, show you um, how horrible you were for disrespecting them and not uh, showing up when you were supposed to and that sort of thing. So circular conversation is one of their favorite little um, word salad techniques. Another technique that they use for word salad is just a complete lack of logic. So for example, if you, they'll, they'll accuse you of cheating. You were at lunch with your mother and your sister and they'll say, I know that you were cheating and you're, you're, you're sitting there defending yourself thinking, what the heck are you talking about? I was at lunch with my mother and my sister. You know that I was. I was texting you the whole time. I sent you pictures of myself there. I mean, and even if you didn't do that, you you know that you that's where you were and you're just like the person who would never cheat. And But yet here they are like saying, well, you're obviously a cheater. Look at what you're wearing. And you're looking at yourself going, I'm wearing jeans and a t-shirt like what you're saying has absolutely no logic whatsoever it makes no sense but here you are defending yourself like there's something wrong with you and 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 it, it's just this utter verbal chaos of of like you're in the twilight zone so that's number two is just a complete lack of logic and another version of word salad is, you know, your typical garden variety gaslighting. And if you want to know more about gaslighting, you should definitely check out my video on gaslighting techniques. But basically it's, it's, it's saying things to make you think that you're crazy. You know, um, they'll say, I'm going to go away for the weekend with my friends. And you'll say, oh, when are you doing that? And they'll, they'll say, oh, we talked about that. And you agreed. Don't you remember? And you're sitting there thinking, no, I, we never had that conversation. <laughs> like, where did that come from? And, and, but when they do that over and over and over again, you really do start to question your own mind. You start to question your own sanity. You start to think, well, maybe, maybe we did have that conversation because they, they, They'll do it to you over and over and over again so many times that you think, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe I am the one that's crazy. Or, and, and what happens with this whole word salad thing is it really just eats away at your self-esteem and it eats away at your sense of self so much so that you really start to question everything about yourself and you start to really believe and, and you've been so traumatized that you start to really believe that gosh, if I were just more perfect, if I were just better, if I were just, if I just tried harder, if I just were more careful with my words, if I were just, if I, if I just checked in with him more and showed him or her how often I 
um, you know, where, where I was. I, I, I can prove to this person, I don't want to say him or her, you know, obviously there's narcissists in all genders. Um, you, you just start to believe, like, I just... I, it's me. It's definitely me. There's something wrong with me. And they, they, they really want you to believe that until something in your little soul. And I always refer to the Maya Angelou, I know why the caged bird sings because that caged bird is your soul. And, and I, when people end up in my office as an attorney and they're ready to get divorced or I'm on a coaching call with somebody who's dealing with a narcissistic business partner or somebody who um, wants to talk with me about figuring out a way or a strategy or leverage with dealing with narcissists, um, they start to, you know, really see that like, this is a soul decision. I call it a soul decision. Your soul knows that something is deeply wrong. Your soul knows that it's time to sing. Your soul knows it's time to be free. And so slowly but surely, you get that little glimpse of light. And that's when you start watching videos like mine or, or many of the others of us who are in this space um, that you know I've collaborated with, such as Dr. Romney, Tina Swithin, Tracy Malone, Kim Saeed, Melanie Tanya Evans, you know, all of us are in this space working for you to, you, you get that glimmer of light, your soul gets that glimmer of light and you go, oh my God, this is me, this is what's happening. And you start get, gathering information and you start getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And that's why I do what I do.